our next session is the state of climate science and policy. I will be moderating this session and will be joined by an esteemed panel of climate experts who were instrumental in the IPCC sixth assessment report. Are we ready? Are we ready for them? We are. First, I would like to call on Dr. Francis X. Johnson, Senior Research Fellow and Climate Policy Lead at the Stockholm Environment Institute Asia Center. He has over 30 years of experience in interdisciplinary energy and climate analyses, capacity building and research, focusing especially on biomass and land use in relation to climate and development goals. He was a lead author for the IPCC Special Report on Climate Change and Land and a member of the writing team of the IPCC AR6 Synthesis Report. Francis, please join me on stage. Next is, Doc, is Professor Edwin Aldrian. He is a professor of meteorology and climatology at, at the Agency for Assessment and Application of Technology, BPPT, Indonesia. He teaches at the University of Indonesia and Bogor Agricultural Institute and Udiana University in Denpasar, Bali. Currently, Prof. Aldrian serves as IPCC Working Group 1 Vice Chair representing Indonesia and countries in the Southwest Pacific region. He is active in promoting climate science nationally and internationally as part of the IPCC outreach program in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Prof. Aldrian, please join us on stage. Next, we have Professor Yong Yu Trisurat. He is a full professor of forestry at Kasetsart University in Bangkok, Thailand. He has been active in the area of, protect, of biodiversity, landscape ecology, climate change, and GIS for over 30 years and has been a frequent contributor to several international agencies. Um, he, he is a co-chair of the Asia-Pacific Biodiversity Observation Network, chair of scientific community for international long-term ecological network for east asia and the pacific region in addition he was a coordinating lead author of the ipcc ar6 working group 2. and lastly we have professor joy Shari roy who is currently the founder director of the center on south and southeast asia multidisciplinary applied research network on transforming societies of global south and the inaugural Magabandu Chair Professor at CERD Asian Institute of Technology. She was in the IPCC 2007 Nobel Peace Prize winning panel and continues as coordinating lead author in fifth and sixth assessment cycles of Working Group 3 of IPCC. Let's give them a round of applause. Give them the energy to start this day. So before I give the floor to Francis, I would like to ask for everyone's help to make sure that we are all on time. If you need to remind me that Charmaine, we want to ask questions, give me a wink. Also, we have our timekeeper on the side. Um, yeah, so everyone, I'm giving the floor to Francis to start this session. Yeah, thanks, uh, Charmaine. And uh, I also like to thank um, uh, all the participants, but also uh, Dr. Surachai for mentioning the science policy interface, which is, of course, at the heart of the mission of the SCI, and also the multi level um, issues because we are working local, national, regional, global. And, and as you mentioned, the regional aspects are underutilized to a significant extent. So um, we will talk about that. We can, uh, should I forward? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, what I'd like to um, uh, explain, first of all, is for those not familiar with the structure of the IPCC assessment, is that this occurs over a very long period of time, about seven years in this case, and there are six reports and one synthesis report, um, and this involves the work of, of thousands of scientists from all over the world. Um, so in 30 minutes, we cannot give you a summary of these thousands of pages and the, uh, I think it's 66,000 references or some, uh, something like this. But so we will give selected uh, findings and, um, and also the 
our slides will have a lot of information, so you won't, we won't be able to cover everything in the slides, but um, these will be available after the event. So um, don't worry if something is unclear because it, there's a lot of information. Um, so, and then just to mention that the, the IPCC assessments include the three working groups, which are the physical science, group one, group two is uh, impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, group three is mitigation. And then there are special reports. This, in this cycle, it was land, oceans, and uh, 1.5, uh, the impacts of 1.5 C. Uh, okay, so first of all, I'd like to say is that it's unequivocal that uh, that uh, human activities are responsible for global warming. So if you look at the slide on the left, this is the so-called hockey stick slide, which shows the rapid increase in temperature in the past decades. And um, this has not been observed in, in more than 100,000 years, this type of temperature. On the right, uh, it's clear that there's no uh, significant st statistical difference um, between observed warming and the human-influenced warming. There are some other natural causes like volcanic activities and so forth. Um, so it's important to realize that um, emissions uh, have grown in almost all regions, but they are distributed very unevenly. The OECD countries, uh, North America, Europe, and and the other countries in the Asia are responsible for, for the majority of emissions. And that's what you see on the left graph, the historical responsibility for climate change and the obligations that come with that. Um, however, the current distribution, of course, is changing uh, due to the patterns of development. And I'd like to draw your attention um, to the situation in, in Southeast Asia. The, the gray part of these graphs shows the uh, emissions or CO2 associated with land use and land use change. And these are very significant in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and so it's, it's an important area to focus on, I think, in the coming uh, years or decades. <clears throat> so what is the big challenge that we face globally? It's to limit warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees C. So some of you are familiar with this graph, but just to say that the orange part it, which is the business as usual, is taking us um, to some place we would not like to be, and that is a warming of uh, somewhere between 2.2 degrees and 3.4 or, or somewhere around that. Um, and this is a very high level of warming, rather dangerous. So where we want to be is the green or preferably the blue, and that's going to require a really significant effort across all uh, sectors. <clears throat> so um, what about investment? You're going to hear, I think, later today from some people working in the financial sectors, and I hope that they will bring their expertise to this issue, because the amount of investment uh, that's needed to reach our climate targets is, in many cases, an order of magnitude higher than what we have today. Um, so if you look particularly at Southeast Asia, um, the range has been estimated to be somewhere between six times as much and 12 times as much investment is needed. So there really is a lot, uh, a lot of investment is needed. How to mobilize this investment is critical. So to finish with some good news, um, because that was a lot of bad news, I know. Um, to finish with some good news, the trends have been very positive in the renewable uh, sectors, particularly photovoltaics, the costs came down faster than anyone realized. So if you look at the graph on the left, you see this rapid uh, decline in uh, the cost of, of PVs, and you see this exponential curve of adoption. Similarly, exponential curve with, with wind and also with uh, passenger uh, vehicles because of the uh, drop in, um, in lithium ion batteries. So I would like to thank you for your attention and um, we'll turn it over uh, to uh, my colleagues here uh, for the other um, dimensions of this presentation. Thanks. Hello, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> it's very nice and welcome to be here. More of you, very important meeting. Uh, 
we would like to have uh, my presentation. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, as you know that uh, Himalaya is the third polar of the world. This is uh, not widely known, but this is uh, the fact that Himalaya become the third polar of the world. The number one polar is the Antarctica, is the the south polar. Everybody know. Number two is the not the not uh, not polar, but the, the Greenland, because Greenland is located in Overland. And the polar is the Himalaya. Uh, Himalaya is uh, contain many ice and ice pier, and then the the flow is going to the east, uh, to the to the China and uh, to South Asia, and then uh, the remaining goes to Mekong River in the South Southeast Asia. So this is uh, not not nobody uh, ever believed that this is our third polar i believe this is will, will be the last uh, experience that we have so uh, rising temperature will mean that uh, you will have uh, more ice uh, melting and the glacier melt and so on like this and this will increase the sea level rise uh, by the uh, the increase in this mean and uh, 3.6 millimeter per year that is twice as far as, uh, as the uh, the rise uh, for the 20th century and uh, this is causing the impact on the issue in the Southeast Asia and uh, uh, the sea level rise also very impacted uh, for example on the uh, city in India, Bangladesh and many other city in the Southeast Asia I uh, think in the many Mekong major city like in Hanoi uh, like in uh, Vietnam and, uh, and Thailand, Cambodia, and so on like this. So uh, this clima climate impact is very much uh, known and then very much affected uh, people live in the uh, this area. Uh, people live in this area is too much. Uh, I think uh, number one in the world. You facing China population, you facing India population, and the Southeast Asia population. This uh, means uh, billion of people uh, like this. Uh, schematic diagram showing to you the the many uh, challenges that we face in the future this is uh, for example i uh, i noted here uh, assemble uh, assemble surface of the land and then so on like this and you see the price uh, flood and uh, social infrastructure uh, upgrade of the system so this is uh, very much uh, needed by us right now Okay, I'm sorry, it doesn't go away. Okay, sorry. Uh, and then uh, we, we have uh, many, uh, many, many uh, activity in, in the Southeast Asia, for example, uh, the Southeast Asia, I, I make this uh, collaboration among the country in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, Philippines, Vietnam, we make a modeling uh, with the domain of uh, what happened in the South Asia. Now the IPCC use our uh, domain and then display to the public, to, to the world. So this means that the, this is uh, some going on regional simulation uh, study for the South Asia. And I think this is uh, very much the, uh, the news that we, we brought today that uh, the climate uh, different by human human is causing temperature and chemistry to the ocean and then we have many things like for example the understanding of the Himalayan as the third uh, polar of the world and then give the Mekong River water of the water quality and so on as we, uh, with the increase of the sea level rise and so on so we may have uh, many uh, study beginning today and then we may discuss uh, in the afternoon what is uh, what we can to strengthen global climate and modeling capacity of the region 
because uh, for us the modeling it is uh, very very much essential and and then we in going to understand what is going on with the system okay uh, that's all uh, i think i believe uh, i can leave to you and thank you very much swadika Okay, good morning. So I am very delighted to be with you this morning and to share my experience with you that I have involved in the uh, AR6 working git 2 as the uh, uh, CLA. <clears throat> so since we have the limited time allocation for each speaker, seven to eight minutes each, so I would like to highlight the key finding based on my experience in uh, forestry, biodiversity, and touch a little bit on the uh, water and food uh, related and the other uh, content I think you can find in the, uh, the report that uh, Francis already mentioned in the previous uh, presentation. So based on the meta analysis, so you can see that in this picture, so thanks uh, consideration to Indonesia, so you have the richest biodiversity in uh, Southeast Asia, and Thailand ranks at the uh, uh, 20 of, of the world. And however, our biodiversity uh, are declining uh, based on the uh, climate change impact. So it depends, the level of the impact is depend on the uh, carbon emission. That, that will cause the problem on the biodiversity loss, the structure change, uh, tree mortality, and Y5 uh, increase in carbon uh, emission. So according to the, uh, the analysis, more than I think 100 or 1,000 of scientific uh, literature, so we find that with 1.5 degree Celsius warming, so most likely we will lost I think about 14% of the biodiversity from today. With the 3 degree Celsius, so we may lost, I think, up to 40%. But if the temperature rising uh, 5 degree Celsius in the next 80 years, so we lost more than 60% of the remaining uh, biodiversity. And if you see the graph, so it's quite clear that the uh, the country which are located in the low altitudes, including Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, we, this will be the high list of biodiversity loss in the future. I think the, uh, the chair already, Dr. Chung Rak, uh, already mentioned for her welcome remark in this morning. So besides that, the higher temperature and long drought will cause about the more dry, uh, uh, residual, and that will be uh, increase the list of the uh, forest fire in the future, which already experienced in Australia, in Hawaii, and right now is already occurred in Indonesia. The peach uh, burning. So if the temperature rise at uh, two degrees Celsius, so it is projected that the high risk of the uh, forest fire will increase. 35%. So if we have four degree Celsius in the future, so the, the high risk of the forest fire will increase up to 70% in the future. And in addition, we will have more frequently of the forest fire. And forest fires cause the main problem also to cause the problem to the tree mortality, not only when the forest fire occurs, but we have the consequent or the long-term impact at least, I think, five to 10 years. So how about the, the water? So the water is also related to the, the changes of the temperature and drawn drought uh, season. So this is the, uh, you can see the picture that it will cause a lot of problem to the food production and nutrition, food security. So with two degree warming, 
So even though we have the early adaptation measure, as it's more likely that this the measure will be not effective. If the temperature rise three or above three degrees Celsius, so if you caught, I think uh, this ether for the food security, this uh, parity, particularly in Africa, in uh, India, and a small island. If you follow the news, you can see that this year, uh, India stopped exporting rice to the world market. So according to my previous uh, analysis in uh, Mekong region, so we predict that we will lose a lot of suitable rice production. And if the, if the population increase in the next 30 years, so the rice production will be not sufficient to provide the food for the increasing population in the future. So what should we do in the future to save biodiversity? So this the famous uh, literature published in, in Nature in a couple years ago. So, so we have to bring a curve, put more effort for biodiversity conservation, like the increasing protected area to 30 percent. However, if we increase protected area, we will lose the land for uh, food production. So it will be the confrontation between development and conservation. And finally, the food price will increase. So this one will be unavoidable. So um, the IPCC working group two, we review a lot of adaptation measures that have been taken and ongoing. So most of them focus on the expansion of protected area, intensive agriculture, smart agriculture, and changing the uh, cropping uh, calendar. So for the water and food related, so these are the, uh, the popular uh, measures to change the uh, uh, planting calendar. However, in addition also the uh, water resources development, however, sometimes the construction of large scale uh, water resources development and uh, management also have the consequence on the other impact, something like the inequality of the local uh, livelihood, so they benefit people and the lost people and also increase uh, Salinity, for example, in the Banglakam modem in the lower north of Thailand. Okay. How about the biodiversity? So a lot of countries, I think more than 140 countries have been committed inside the agreement of the Paris Agreement and biodiversity uh, conservation. Uh, last December, the uh, Kunming and Montreal G Global Biodiversity Work, or GBF, have the four goals and 23 targets. So one of the targets is very important, is the target number three, that we have encouraged the party member to enlarge the protected area and conservation to 30% by 2030 or 30 by 30. And Thailand is already committed to expand and to revise the National Biodiversity Action Plan to achieve the 30% in the future. But not only in Thailand, but also working collaboratively with the neighboring country because the biodiversity, uh, like the, uh, the wildlife landscape species, will move from one country to the other country. So the biodiversity corridor is very important. And in addition, on the adaptation measure cannot prevent the future climate change and loss and damage, particularly endemic and unique and endemic and threatened species and one and other. Uh, because this one is very uh, vulnerable in the future. So we have to be careful about the more adaptation and suitable adaptation to be taken in the right place. So that's all my presentation. Thank you very much.
Ich mal gleich. Um, no. We need to go back. Oh, it is gone. Yeah, I, I can see. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry for the technicalities. Um, good morning, everybody. And you have heard that what the physical science has to say from Edwin that how uh, the climate change is going to change the physical parameters of the earth system. And then you saw that if this physical parameters changes, then what the impact is going to be in terms of the human um, social impacts. So now what I'm going to share with you is in the working group three, what we try to say about how to mitigate the climate change, because it is quite clear that uh, we are not on track, despite all these talks and all these cooperation and commitments at the national level by the national determined contributions. So if we summarize very simply, what does IPCC report talks about that how much reduction is needed and how much we have not yet done which simply means that in next, next six years, the globally, we need to reduce the CO2 emission by 48%, which is not a matter of joke. And in 14 years, we need to bring it down by 80%. And in 24 years, we need to bring it down by 99%. So this is the level of mitigation globally we need to achieve. It is no one single country's responsibility. It needs to be the responsibility of all the countries, those who are emitting um, greenhouse gases. But there is some good news, which we could come up with by assessing the scientific reports, which is coming out all over the world from different scientists, that if we consider all our possible actions which can be taken in the supply side, supply side sector, that means supply of energy and supply of goods and services, and also the demand side, how as individuals, how as industries we need goods and services, then there are possibilities that we can actually reduce emissions if we look into the sectoral activities because the policy making happens at the sectoral level. Even if we take in each of the sectors, then at least we know by 2030 we can have our emission. So it shows that given all the technologies off the shelf, if deployed in different countries, in different sectors, we can still make our emissions half by 2030. So what we said is needed, is possible, if we put our actions in place. So for the first time, the IPCC report could show that in each sector, by all the time, each country struggles thinking that how can I get so much of money for investing in decarbonizing the electric supply sector? I'm just giving one example, right? But then this time, the IPCC report, we could say that you need not only focus on the energy supply side decarbonization. If you look into the energy demand side decarbonization, that means if you make your, um, I mean, homes more energy efficient, and maybe more passive solar passive houses. So there are different ways how you can make your products so that you can emit less uh, greenhouse gases for each production. Also for each of our service that we consume, we can also reduce our emission. Just to give an example, when I live in AIT, Asian Institute of Technology within the campus, I don't own a car. I don't need a car. I walk and it's good for my health. And also it, it's good for the planetary health. We heard in the morning, professor said about the One Health concept. So we can actually contribute each one of us every day for reducing our demand for energy services also. 
So this is something very important. Even if you just think of this room, we can raise the temperature one degree that will not harm our health. Actually, that will be beneficial for our health, but we can reduce for one degree reduction in the temp uh, uh, rise in the temperature within the room for the air conditioning uh, uh, managing it, we can reduce one kilowatt hour of emission. So this is some, I mean, energy consumption and the related emission. So this is something which we are saying that if we look into each of the sectors, then these green lines, the whole bar shows that, the whole bar shows that, uh, the whole white bar shows that how much reduction is needed by 2050. And then green one shows if you do the demand side actions, that means small, small technologies in all the sectors, we can reduce 44% in food sector by making choice for sustainable, healthy diet. We can reduce emission in the food sector and then also by reducing the food waste and also in the land transport by using more of public transport, walking and cycling, active transport, so that we can reduce 67% of the emission. And then, so this is all the numbers we are showing. And so we are saying that we can reduce the, and rest of it is what we need decarbonizing the supply of energy. So we are saying that it's not to worry that all the burden counts on the energy supply sector, but the demand side sector can also be a lot of actions can be taken and that can help. And uh, the other one which want to say that what I told you now is about the global picture, but what is about the regional picture? We do not go country by country assessment in IPCC report, but based on the country by country assessment, we come to the global assessment. But what here, this is very important message for this whole region is that when we are saying that we can take action in the demand side, so we can reduce the burden on the supply side, but supply side decarbonization is must. So how do we do that supply side decarbonization and what it means for this region? So if we look at the, this left hand side figure is shows that historically how different countries contributed to the cumulative emission. And in that it is true that Southeast Asia and Pacific is, has I mean, historically less responsibility, but going forward, we have to be very uh, cautious what kind of infrastructure we are going to um, you know, build. So this shows that the red one in the right-hand side, the red ones uh, in the right-hand side figure is showing that what is the fossil fuel-based or coal-based power infrastructure exists in the, this region. And that is something already countries decided to uh, and bring it down to zero. So it means that if all the fossil fuel based facilities need to be stopped in this region as soon as possible, it means that there has to be a very high and transition will happen in the whole society, not only in terms of infrastructure, but also in terms of investment and also in terms of employment. So how do we do these justice in transition? So there has to be new businesses need to come up and we really need new infrastructure to build in this uh, region. And from the morning I have been hearing that there needs need for cooperation and IPCC report make it very clear that in the whole region, if one country may not be able to decarbonize their energy supply sector, but if there is a regional grid, then the grid decarbonization can sort out this problem, and which means that the geopolitically there needs to be more cooperation in the region, and that has to be worked out. So it's just not the technology. I'll t just take one more minute. Uh, I mean, it's just not the technology, but also the geopolitics, which has a very important role to play, and the sociologists and economists have a role to play, and how do we do this? But we also need to uh, understand that there are several suggestions to decarbonize by the carbon dioxide removal, which says that emit now and uh, 
do, uh, remove it later, but this is going to be an uncertain technology and the country should not be lining up behind that. So really what is important is that how we can decarbonize the uh, whole system from the very beginning so that we do not, uh, I mean, later on, live with many stranded assets uh, in the different countries and the companies. And what it says is, just to give one example, that globally what it means that more electrification of the all sectors will happen. So how electricity sector can be decarbonized is a major challenge. And which one of the scenarios which IPCC report is saying is feasible, but then it means now we need to take technological and policy level actions to achieve this. So what it simply means is that how to maintain the employment and decarbonize at the same time. Many countries have already started their um, national just transition commissions or task force, and that is really, really helping. And many countries have actually, over the past 10 years, have been able to keep their growth possible with low energy and low emission. So it's, uh, the IPCC report gives the hope that it is possible. The examples are there. It's not that anyone can say, that. how do we do it? It's already there existing so the countries can learn from each other and there are really the international corporations comes in. And I know I have taken a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our panel. Um, is everyone okay? That wasn't at all very good news. Um, I, but now we have um, some time to ask our panel a few questions. But before I open the floor for questions from the audience, I, I, have, I have a few questions myself. I wonder if I can, can I, yes. Can I sit here, is it okay? So that it feels just a bit more friendly. Yes. Okay, since my first question um, is for Professor Aldrian, since you're sitting next to me. Um, all of that we've seen in the past um, 20 minutes are really important um, climate science findings. But now, you know, they're all, they're all varied. They're quite complex for some people, some of us here, including myself. So my question is, what advice can you, as a climate scientist, give to policymakers in the region who want to think long term and develop um, systems to manage um, these climate risks? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm very sorry that uh, I'm not very satisfied with the RPCC report. Actually, the the discussion about the third polar is not very much covered in the RPC report IR6. I don't know why. I think because uh, one of the problem because uh, so, so many European mandate in this report. Maybe this is not uh, European, this is Himalaya. This is located in Asia. So not many cover in the ASEAN region. But it is uh, must be covered, I think, because uh, largely impact on the people living in the uh, surrounding, in the South Asia, in the China, in the uh, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, especially the one who received MECO. So in the future, uh, I, I myself coming from Indonesia, we have a very small uh, issue on the ice uh, in the tropics, in the Papua, Indonesia. But it is too small, and then uh, I don't think it will be last maybe uh, one, de uh, two decades more. So uh, we just uh, uh, accept this idea, but but because the ice I think will be melted and then will be gone forever. But uh, for Himalaya, this is very big issue. I think this is the issue that cover uh, many like billion people, maybe. Um, maybe two, uh, three billion people. Huh? India, India, yeah. Okay, so this is very much impacted on the biodiversity and so on like this. So if we, if we cover this area and then study the impact, uh, I believe this is very much important. 
for the future generation. Thank you, Professor Aldrian. Now let's zero in on adaptation. Professor Trisurat, this question is for you. How can policymakers coordinate regionally and prioritize integrative adaptation strategies that avoid maladaptation and build resilience? Okay, thank you very much for your question. So if we see right now the, uh, the climate change that is related to the uh, policy uh, relevant and the biodiversity is a science but both agreement or the reference free are quite uh, separately. So first, I think we need the synergy between the climate change and biodiversity and working uh, together. And secondly, I think at the regional levels, either in the GMS or ASEAN, I think the mechanism already in place. Uh, for science, we have the MRC and a lot of academic or research institute such as the uh, SEI and the MRC. And also the uh, Minister of Environment of Asia have signed a lot of agreement. For example, the biodiversity conservation, the health pollution the, uh, uh, problem since uh, 2000. And the loss map have been uh, uh, proposed in 2021. But however, the Leo the actual implementation on the ground is not uh, uh, visualized. So we need more uh, collaboration. So what I'm thinking in the short term, if you see it in the ASEAN, we have 10 countries. In the 10 countries, we have the different capacity. So the most important one that we can do in the short term is the capacity building uh, to train the uh, officer and the stakeholder in the uh, uh, poor capacity building. And secondly, share the lesson, either the failure or the success uh, project implementation, like the uh, uh, IPCC, but IPCC is quite broad at the, uh, the core of level. So we can scale down to the regional level, share the, the success and the failure of the, uh, the project. And for the long term, I think there are a lot of development in the country, for example, the dam construction. But the problem not cross, the problem and benefit not only in the location of the country that implemented, but also the problem across the country. So the trans transboundary strategic environmental assessment or the transboundary EIA should be implemented and what you call inform the, the, uh, the neighboring country. And for the, the health, a problem in the forest fire, so this one also important. So without the original collaboration, I think we cannot solve this problem within uh, the one country. So we need more collaboration and action on the ground with involvement with the on multi uh, 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 stakeholder, the government and the local people, as uh, Dr. Sorosha uh, mentioned this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Trisura. Um, now we go into mitigation, Professor Joy. Um, my question is, how can we ensure that in the Mekong and Southeast Asian region, climate mitigation is integrated into broader development goals to ensure a just and equitable transition? Yeah, this is a very good question. And uh, actually in the IPCC report, we said that um, though, uh, uh, what are the synergies between the mitigation actions and the sustainable development goals. Because for most of these countries, priority is sustainable development goal or the development goal. So we try to see that even if someone uh, pursues the sustainable development goal, then how the climate action can also be served and the vice versa, right? If you take a climate mitigation action, then how can it help in sustainable development goal so that the countries can have uh, one action uh, and then say, just to give an example, suppose you change the building rules in such a way or make the set point of these um, air conditioners at a particular comfortable, uh, healthy uh, level, then we have seen that, that uh, I mean, 
uh, not only helps in mitigation, but also helps in achieving multiple sustainable development goals. So we said that um, in both in 1.5 report and the um, six assessment report that what we need to look at is the different mitigation actions, prioritize them. They are there already in the report and which says that how they help in uh, advancing sustainable development goal as well as there are some trade-offs, right? So suppose, as I said, if you shut down a coal fire plant, then you will lose the employment of many people. So how do you change that? So IPCC report says what we need is like what he said, the capacity building, it should be the reskilling and retraining of the people so that you make this shift, you see that how in say 10% of the employment needs to be changed, then that's the goal and you do the retraining and recapacity building. Thank you so much. And lastly, Dr. Johnson, how do we promote and prioritize sustainable land management practices that mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, enhance carbon sequestration, and increase resilience for climate change impacts? Um, yeah, thanks, Charmaine. I think there has been a tendency on the mitigation side of climate to um, emphasize the phase out of, of fossil fuels in favor of renewables. And as we discussed uh, earlier, the barriers for this are, are have been disappearing fast. The, the cost is very competitive. Um, there are all kinds of opportunities. The financing is improving. There are still a need for improving financing in the global south, of course, which is always a little bit more challenging. But there really is no excuse on the energy side, we might say. And in addition to that, as, as Professor Jerry Asher noted, the, um, the demand side, these, a lot of these are, are well known and just take some effort, basically, a little bit of effort. And uh, so this, but yet here we have the, the land sectors which um, have not come as far. And why, why is that actually? And um, you might say that um, what happens with the land sectors, unlike energy and industry, that uh, oh, suddenly you have to deal with people, you know? Uh, people don't live in, in factories and power plants, they live on the land. And, um, and what has been discovered is this takes more time and, and more effort. And um, so there has been a tendency not to take the actions that are needed in the land sectors, many of which also contribute to improved health, <clears throat> both human health, but also the health of animals in the livestock sector um, and um, air pollution issues and so forth. So here we have these opportunities um, to combine climate, climate benefits with, with health benefits and lifestyle benefits, quality of life issues in the land sectors. And, um, and that also uh, normally contributes very much to adaptation. So this is an opportunity to go from um, seeing people as an obstacle to um, empowering people and making them part of the solution. And this is what we need in, in the land sectors in a big way. And Southeast Asia, I think, is a great example. So thank, thank you. you so much. OK, I think we have a few short minutes for questions for our panel. So the floor is open. If you have questions, um, we have mics around at the back. There is one at the back with Rajesh. Sure, Professor Chisarai. So yes, yeah. please. Uh, uh, um, maybe uh, the question first? Yes, the question from, from the gentleman. We are coming to you, sir. <laughs> okay, is the mic working? Okay, there we go. Hi, my name is Tarek Kettleson. I think that was a, a really fascinating panel. Um, Ms. Charmaine, you mentioned that the panel was bearers of bad news. Um, I actually think there was some very good news in what was being discussed. Um, and it's probably something that is sitting underneath the surface of the discussion around climate change. Um, I think it's what the IPCC has done is perhaps one of our biggest scientific achievements in uh, kind of modern times, not because of the tens of thousands of pages that the authors have worked you know, meticulously on, but because they've taken that complexity of the whole Earth system and been able to kind of condense all of that into one target, 1.5 degrees Celsius. 
taking all of that complexity and making it into something simple like that is you know the basis of the um uh, the science to policy strength of what the ipcc is doing and it gives every sector as professor joy Shri has shown gives every sector a target that we we all share we all collectively work towards and we all work out okay in our subsector here's what energy or land use or whatever can do to achieve that um, so that's that's a, a fantastic new story coming out of the ipcc process but my question relates to resilience more broadly than climate change this region, the Mekong, is facing a whole range of environment, environmental drivers, arguably more important for the Mekong than, than um, the CO2 emissions, as we've seen from the, the level of emissions. Where is our effort to put together all of this complexity, all of this understanding of the other drivers and the changes that we're experiencing to come up with simple targets for, uh, for all of these other drivers that we are facing in the region? I think there's... Uh, there's a, a process of the IPCC has something to share for us in terms of um, resilience more broadly in the Mekong. And I wonder if any of the IPC or IPCC authors who are involved in the process can comment on that. Um, let me take the first uh, uh, cut that uh, actually it shows, I'm just giving one example, right? Say we talk about the air pollution in the cities and uh, IPCC report clearly shows that the air pollution, solution to air pollution and the climate change have the same drivers. So if you address the air pollution, if you do not want to prioritize the climate change, still you will be doing the same um, effect with the climate change. So this is one thing. So you can look at your local problems, but also other thing which has been shown by uh, Edwin that um, if your water flow is reducing over time due to the loss of the glaciers, then your water availability will be changing and water quality will be changing. So you need to be planning for your water management from now itself, right? So, and water is a very local issue, very, close to heart issue. And also in the agriculture sector, we have shown that how you provide the irrigation through different uh, technologies. Just to give an example, the demand side uh, again, is that you change your flooding, flooded irrigation to sprinkler irrigation or to uh, the drip irrigation. Your irrigation water changes and your energy and resource gets saved. So we are saying in IPCC report that how you can dematerialize, how you reduce your material use and also energy, and that can help in managing the climate change better. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, very okay. briefly, we have another question. Yes, sir. So based on the, your question, I think for the regional issue we are facing now is the land conversion for the uh, bioenergy plantation, like the oil palm, the sugar cane, and they have the consequence on the fire and has a uh, uh, pollution, okay? So during the political campaign uh, before the general election, University, we hold the, uh, the seminar and invite the uh, political uh, member party to uh, mention what are their measures to solve this problem. So on party, they all agree that the bio economy or the uh, BCG uh, to change from the uh, cash crop plantation to the uh, forest plantation. So this one can solve the problem not only for the forest fire, but also the promote to the livelihood of the local people and change the climate change. And we already signed the MOU with the Swedish uh, uh, government to promote the wood city. Because if the, the people use more wood from sustainable management, so we can keep the carbon in the press in the forest plantation and rather than the cash crop. And also carbon can stop in the furniture and, and, and so on. So this one is something like the, uh, a case study or, or the showcase that should be uh, promoted and change the people's uh, perception that we use wood, we destroy the forest, but in fact, it's not. This is the one approach that we can uh, moving toward to the uh, uh, net uh, zero uh, carbon emission. Okay, thank you. Our uh, next question, sir, please. Good morning uh, to everybody. I'm Bakhtan Singh from uh, Institute of Policy and Management at Hanoi, National University of Hanoi in uh, Hanoi. I have two questions. The first question is related to something that already raised uh, before this. How can we make use of the information prepared by the IPPC uh, report? Because I myself was one of the lead author of the IPPC strict report. And through this process, I one of my concerns is 
how can we make use of huge knowledge created there to, be make, to make it more use, useful to other users, for example, for the community? Is there any chance for any other player to, to, to make this kind of contribution, to make this result? Is it more easy understood and can be useful for the community? That's my first question. My second question is, uh, if we talk about uh, climate change and we talk a lot about uh, carbonization, carbon market, and uh, anything around this, uh, this cause. One thing we have not really discussed about the climate justice. That's I think that how, how much we can be paid certain attention to what is happening at locally, at the community who are facing day-to-day -day impact of the, this. Uh, how can we work closely with those who are most vulnerable to to, to work there with them day to day, and how can we contribute to this kind of debate? This is my two questions I should like to raise. Thank you. Um, yeah, we were going to briefly take communication and, and Professor Ashri, the climate justice part, and then the other professors can compliment. I think on communication, um, it, it has become a very big challenge because with each assessment, it's more material, more complex, and how, how to communicate it. But there are a lot of communication professionals that have joined this effort. Um, it's one of the reasons we have our artists today to think of another way to communicate the issues because um, the, um, it, is a lot of, it is a dense amount of information. And um, even among the authors themselves, everyone has their specialties. So um, no single person can understand it all. Anyway, so um, the, uh, to have a diversity of actors and to be able to communicate also in shorter, um, uh, simple messages, but we cannot lose the, the key goals uh, in all of this because um, there's, no, there's no escaping the, the physical science. The physical science doesn't care that we don't understand, so. <laughs> and just to give you example, after a uh, fourth assessment report, what we did was, um, depending on the regional need, uh, we worked with the authors and the local, uh, I mean, many, many groups, uh, where we came up with small booklets, say, just highlighting very important ones, say, for building sector, what needs to be done, for transport sector, say, 10 points. So that was like what is happening now, say, SEI and Australian government are collaborating, and some Chulalanka University can participate, and then they can prepare these booklets, and which can be in Thai language also, and that will be very useful. This was done, and the, these are there in the repository of the IPCC report, so you can just take a look at that. And in terms of climate justice, I mean, you know, what I feel is that while, um, uh, I mean, authoring the report, what we lack sometime is the local case studies from these uh, developing countries. And I have seen that, uh, say for example, in this South Asian, Southeast Asian region especially, there are many local language case studies, but they are, they needs to be translated to English and go there, right? So what I feel can be done is that as a policy level, that more authors need to be nominated to the IPCC process. And that's the climate uh, uh, change focal point can do that. So that's the, from the academic institution that lobbying can happen, and it's not a tough thing that can happen. And the other one which we saw on the ground is that if you integrate the local information into the scientific information, then climate justice works better. Just to give an example, because right now I'm working on the sufficiency economy of, um, uh, I mean, Thailand, and I'm looking into the whole history. And because there is a whole discourse on, in the IPCC level that whether we can have, like what we have efficiency policy, can we have a sufficiency policy? And I was looking into Thai, um, uh, I mean, uh, growth of this whole knowledge with one of my Thai students. And 
I'm amazed there is so much to know and which can go to the global level. So these are our responsibilities, how we can take this information for global dissemination also. So the justice comes if you really have the knowledge built better and stronger on the local knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our final question, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Peck Bay from the Samanet. Um, thank you very much for the point that uh, Professor Roy just mentioned because it fit into the question that I would like to ask and also touching on what Dr. Aldrin said at the beginning with regards to the uh, representation in the production of the IPCC. Um, because uh, yesterday we spent the whole day talking about co-production. So the question that I would like to put to the panel is, can you go a little bit deeper by what you mean by representation in the production of these IPCC report? Is it because of the lack of uh, representative of the scientists that are actually coming from the region? Or it's a matter of just uh, not having the data in order to actually uh, be analyzed and looked at and actually make the findings more uh, representative? Um, because as a researcher in the region, a lot of the time we have the difficulty of actually getting access to the data either because it doesn't exist or it's too expensive to actually get the data. There might be means to get the data, but it just we cannot pay for that. Um, is that what you mean by representation in the production of the IPCC report or is it like something deeper that we didn't know? Okay, uh, I think as a part of our IPCC, I may answer the question. Uh, as you know that uh, from previous uh, question that uh, the bigger representative you are in the IPCC, the more message you get through into the global level. I think this is uh, true. For example, the we have working group four actually uh, from the inventory. Inventory is uh, the mechanism to calculate how much uh, carbon you save, how much carbon you uh, save and then make it into business. For example, the, you can uh, put in the dollar account. Uh, the more you you have a, a representative in this working group, the more your country can do something. For example, uh, you can do uh, to save a banana in this in this country, but this banana is different from uh, South Asia, different from the African, from the uh, South America. So you must have the local knowledge. What is the banana can conserve carbon on this case? So the more you you have the representative there, the more you have uh, your message going through. Uh, this is what message I today uh, give to you that. The Mekong River uh, community does not uh, get the Himalaya as the third polar message into into global action. So you must put uh, more me people working on this design and then put in the RPCC. That's the only way you can do it. Okay, thank you so much. Just okay, one one information which might be useful for all of you that the seventh assessment report is going to start, right? And if you go to the IPCC website, you will see that any individual can participate in the IPCC process in four ways. One is you can be the coordinating lead author, you can be the lead author, you can be a contributing author, just to, uh, 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 I mean, put your special knowledge, one paragraph to that. So uh, the other one is that you can be the reviewer of the report. And when you are reviewing, because IPCC sends it out for public review. So one, it comes as a public review, you can comment in any part and say that, okay, this means that the Thailand, this good practice is not at all represented in the report. And I'm suggesting these um, uh, uh, studies to be included in the review. And that will be taken up because IPCC has to address to each and every comment. So I would say that more active participation from everybody to the IPCC website, through the IPCC website, to, to improve the report, to get it better represented. Everybody has a scope to contribute there. So please use your uh, power to influence IPCC report. Thank you so much. And with that, I would like to thank our panel for this very insightful um, discussion. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>